Well, hello everybody. Welcome back. I am so sorry about the long delay and getting back to you and us picking up Matthew 24 and where we were going to go in Luke and the words of our Savior. However, there has been much going on <laughs> and much revealing by the Spirit. This has been one heck of a week, everybody. And I am sure I am not alone in experiencing this. And the Spirit has been speaking loudly. God is really, really reaching out and showing His hand and His grace and His mercy and His truth. It's pouring out like I just have never experienced in my walk with Him. I'm sure you're all feeling it to some extent. These pictures that I have up here, these are the pictures that I took of that bright light star planet, whatever it is over my house that appears every night. And I've consulted many people and they've told me this is Venus. Well, I think we can all agree there's something much more going on here than this just being Venus. And when we look at the stars, if you're really looking at God's creation, you see the difference. You see something has changed. I have never seen the stars this bright and brilliant and big. Something is changing. And though I'm not hundreds and hundreds of years old, despite the fact that my birth certificate says that I am, says I'm almost as old as Christ, but that's not true. And um, I'm not hundreds of years old. But I have been on this earth for over a half a century. And being in that generation where you went outside to play and you weren't allowed to hang around in the house, your mother just would not have it. And we spent a lot of time outdoors and we would have to be drug in at night. And we loved to look at the stars and lay on our backs and look at clouds and God's creation. And we knew it was God's creation. And we felt closer to Him, and we still do when we look at His creation. We see the works of His hand. But with that said, <laughs> I know nothing has ever been like this before, though man will tell you it is, and it's not, and we all know that in our souls. And the Spirit has been speaking so loudly to me, and I'm sure He has been to all of you, because He's, he's working. He's working very, very strong right now. And he revealed some really deep truths to me. And I can be kind of dunced sometimes when God's trying to get my attention and show me something. I often have to really pray on it, talk to him, seek his face, because I miss it. I miss the bigger picture of it. I know he's speaking, I know he's doing something, but I often miss the big picture. And he's just been pouring out, showing me how awesome and magnificent and powerful his spirit is and his grace. And, uh, You know, we've all had enemies. We've all experienced those that seem to come against us or even when we're doing the right thing or even when we're out there and we were lost and we thought that people came into our lives and or crossed our paths or 
Sometimes it's even within our own family. And we think that this person is against us. But I can tell you this. Our enemies, who we thought were enemies, were just other hurting, lost little sheep. Unknowing. And this is why Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Because as you extend that grace to them, so does God extend his grace to you. And then you start to understand that person. It doesn't necessarily mean you agree, but you start to have compassion and understanding. And you find out that they really were never your enemy. They were just someone in your life that you thought was in your way or giving you a difficulty or challenging you. And now is the time to have compassion and understand what God was doing in your life all those years. Some many decades ago, it doesn't matter. It's really not something to be looked over. It's really not something to just turn your blind eye to because it's really something he's speaking right now. And the other thing that he was telling me was that I didn't even realize I was doing it and I was murmuring and he hates it. And I'm going to tell you why. He hates it. But I thought I was explaining my situation or just updating a brethren on what's going on. And uh, I didn't realize it was coming out as murmuring. And he hates it. And they murmured in the wilderness. And they all not entered into the promised land, everybody. And the reason is, is because whether we call it venting or we just call it communicating, it's deadly. And it takes you off that path that God has designed for you, that narrow path that gets narrower and narrower. And then what happens is, your, your situation gets mistaken by a well-meaning person because maybe you just didn't explain it right or you just didn't realize how it was sounding. And you might Maybe you left out a important fact or something and they really don't have any understanding. And Here's what the Lord said to me. I'm going to share this with you because I really did not realize that I was murmuring. And he dealt with me about it. And I was talking about something going on with my, even my own physical body. And uh, I really didn't realize that he's all things are for his purpose when you're in him and uh, he's doing a work so I had been talking to a sister I didn't realize that I was murmuring and he showed me that when we murmur the person we're talking to, it pulls them off the narrow path. And because then they're looking into your situation and there's no way they can know because we could never explain something in fullness that God has it in his eyes. And, um, I'm telling you, 
I was, I always talk to God no matter what I'm doing, but I have my time with him in the mornings and when I'm in the shower. And I've explained that to you about his grace and the living water and cleansing our spirits just as we cleanse our flesh bodies. And I was seeking him. And as I was going through my routine in the day, I was talking to him. And the Lord just really spoke to me. And I sought his face. I really did. I pray and I really seek his face, everyone. And I suggest we all do this. Not his hand, everyone. His face. And, you know, the Lord has been, he started showing me his face when I would pray. Oh, Lord, it's been going on for about six to nine months. And then when I would close my eyes, I would see the Lord Jesus' face. I would see it as clear. And now I don't just see his face. I just see his eyes. And his eyes have different emotions. Pure love and kindness. And then I'll see tears. And then I will see at times even he's enraged. His eyes are just huge. And... Um, Then he showed me the eyes of the lion. And I know we all know that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And there's a reason for that. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So I sought him in the spirit. I was praying and I saw his face. And I saw him on the cross, his face, just his face. And he had the crown of thorns on his head. And the blood was dripping down and it was running into his eyes. And I got confirmation of this. And he revealed something so strong to my spirit. And he said, I lead and I put the solitary and families and I set the race which you are to run my grace is sufficient for you and then he reminded me of Paul and he Paul said I sought the Lord three times to remove this thorn in my flesh and it's a messenger of Satan to buffet me but see the Lord answered him and he said my grace is sufficient for you Oh, immediately I repented. I saw it. And I saw where I went wrong that day. And I seen where I went wrong before. And I was murmuring and venting. And he told me, do not murmur. For you do not know what I am doing. And that's how you fall out of my will. He told me my words impact others and that there is no way they can understand what he declares as our individual races that we have to run. And we need to finish that race. It's imperative. No matter what it looks like, we have to run that race, everybody. He's designed where we are where we're going, what we've been through. It's all purposed, everyone. And he told me, only, only I understand my children's race and their walk. And he said, it is not fair to your brethren when you're murmuring and venting what I'm working out in your life by my wondrous hand. He told me he's the only one that understands. And he told me to come to him when I'm wearied, tired, sick. I 
am to do that to, and pour out my heart to him and no one else. And he told me, you've run this race and you're in the home stretch. And when you're weak, I am your strength. I am strong and I will deliver you. And he told me not to stop running my race for he's faithful. And he asked me a question. I had no answer for. He said, how do you know what I'm doing? I have my hand on you. I do all things for the good of you, though you cannot see it. Well, everyone, my heart and my soul, I knew deep in my heart and my soul at that moment to repent. And to ask my sister to forgive me for putting her in a situation that she just was not to be burdened with. And I thought it was innocent. I did not know. See, <clears throat> our brothers and sisters that are in the body and they know us and we're together, whether it's you know, whatever, however we're communicating, whether it's face-to-face -face or email or telephone, or whatever mode of communication. If they pray for you and they love you with brotherly love, that is all we can ask of anyone, everyone. Because I knew at that moment all the things that I was trying to figure out or I was venting about or complaining or whatever I was doing. It's in his hands. He knows what we're going to face. He knows what we have to endure. And he's doing a work in us perfectly, though it looks like it might be a burden. See, when we murmur, vent, complain, whatever it is, when we fall off the narrow path that he's put us on, and then when we're murmuring and complaining, we take our brethren there with us or whoever we're talking to. I was so ashamed. I did not see it. And then he gave me confirmation. I'm talking confirmation. In his word. <laughs> I was led. I prayed. And uh, I have these old antique prayer cards. And I pulled one. And uh, it was a verse from Hebrews 12. And I'm telling you, it was just so amazing what it said. And I'm going to read it to you. The prayer card said first that He's doing a work in us. And I'm going to read you Hebrews 12. So therefore we also having so great a cloud of witnesses lying around us, having laid inside every weight. Now that was so significant because I was talking about that very thing. Having laid aside every weight and the easily surrounding sin, through patience, let us also run the race set before us, looking to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, having despised the shame, and sat down at the right 
of the throne of God. For consider him who had endured such gainsaying of sinners against himself, that you do not grow weary, fainting in your souls. Oh boy, was that so powerful right there. You did not yet resist unto blood, wrestling against sin. And have you forgotten the exhortation which he speaks with you as with sons? My sons, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor faint while being corrected by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and whips every son whom he receives. And that's in Pro, uh, Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, by the way, everyone. Verse 7, if you endure discipline, God is dealing with you as sons. For who is the son whom a father does not discipline? But you are, if you are without discipline, of which all you have become sharers, then you are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, indeed, we have fathers of our flesh as correctors, and we respect them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits, and we shall live? For they truly disciplined us for few days, according to the things seeming good to them. But he, for our profit, in order for us to partake of his holiness, and all discipline for the present indeed does not seem to be joyous, but grievous. But afterward, it gives back peaceable fruit of righteousness to the ones having been exercised by it. Because of this, straighten the hands hanging alongside and the having been enfeebled knees. And make straight tracks for your feet that the lame not be turned aside, but rather healed. Listen, that's Isaiah 35, 3 and Proverbs 4, 26. And this was exactly what I was t talking about and uh, murmuring and venting about. Verse 14, eagerly pursue peace with all and holiness without which no one will see the Lord watching diligently that not lack from the grace of God. That no root of bitterness growing up may crowd in on you and through this many be defiled. This is what murmuring leads to, everyone. Complaining. It puts a root of bitterness. You're not happy. You're focusing on your situation or your infirmity or your difficulties. You're not looking at the cross. You're not looking at the greater purpose. This is what I was doing, everyone. And we, we have to be very, very aware of this. It, listen, to whom much is given, much is expected. And God has poured out his grace upon us. And he is doing a wonderful work. And he's going to use us greatly in his kingdom. And the devil will use our infirmities, our difficulties, and the things that seem to really distract us or bother us. And just really get us off the beaten path, everyone. All right, verse 16. Lest any fornicator or profane one as Esau, who for one feeding gave up his birthright. Now, Esau was Jacob's brother. And Esau gave up his birthright because he was a little hungry. <laughs> and he gave up his birthright for a bowl of porridge. <laughs> Listen, there's times when we don't realize what we're doing. Do you think if Esau realized what he was doing, he'd have done that? That he'd have gave up his birthright? I'm trying to put this the best way I can. But we often do not understand. God's ways are not our ways, everyone. <laughs> we look at things through faulty eyes. We don't understand. 
and he's doing a magnificent work. And we think it's a burden. I can tell you that everything we go through, everything that really irritates us, frustrates us, even hurts us. I know especially at this time is because God's doing a work and he's going to press the oil out of you. And for each thing that comes in that light, it's revealing something of the deepest corner of ourselves that we're blinded to. And God has to magnify it in another person, in another situation, to make us aware of it. See, we're not sitting there as clean as we think we are. And we clean the outside of the platter but then the platter still has some dirt on the inside of the platter that no one sees, but it's there and it's affecting our plate and our heart and our walk and our ministry and our testimony. And don't think you don't have a testimony, a witness, a ministry, because that is what you're here for. We each carry it. We are a walking testimony ministry. If you're a believer, <laughs> you have a testimony and you have a witness and you have a ministry. The disciples were persecuted for their faith and they were persecuted for spreading the Holy Spirit they were told not to they were told to be quiet they were told to stop it and they didn't you cannot hide your light under a bushel you are not to now is the time. Now is the time for you to reach out, for you to help others know what's at hand in a loving, loving way. You don't beat them over the head. You don't knock them out the first words you say. You have compassion. You listen. You cry with them. You laugh with them and then you tell them the good news and you tell them what's happening in the most delicate way you can. The way Jesus did. If you're all focused on the beast and scared of the beast, then how can the Holy Spirit move through you? The beast to the disciples was the government, was the ones that could punish them for speaking out. Mm -hmm. Well, now we have the beast, the real beast, the worldwide beast, the beast, the fourth beast of Daniel, the first beast of Revelation, the iron teeth, the nails of brass that covers the globe Are you ducking for cover? Are you hiding what God has given you? Are you going to go and just stay in seclusion and not spread the truth, the love, the grace of God at this time 
when it is the most important time ever to be there, speaking out, witnessing, proclaiming the power of God. Oh, everyone, everyone, do you realize that everyone we skip over, everyone that if we withdraw when we are to stand up, and everyone that we sh should have been the one to witness to, <laughs> and we didn't. It's a grave infarction against the Lord, and their blood will be on our hands because we had the opportunity. And, and, and when that's revealed to you, you can't go back and do it. You can't because God will reveal it in that day. And he will say, I gave this to you to do. I gave you all this knowledge. I gave you all this wisdom in my word and in my truth. And you, 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 you just poured it all into yourself and you didn't go out among wolves and do my works. We can't do that, everyone. We have no fear. How? Why do you fear the beast? Why do you fear what the devil may do? It shows the degree of our faith when we do that. God is on the throne. God is in control. And when you're doing his work and you're doing it in his grace and his power and his spirit, nothing can hinder that. But if you cower and you don't face the truth and you don't stand on the truth and you don't stand on the Holy Spirit and the power in that, then you're giving more credence and place to the devil than you are your Lord. And it says a lot. The devil is really tricky, everyone. This is the testing of our faith. This is the patience of the saints. And really, really, really trusting your Lord. It's, it's really showing what's really under the skin. It's really showing what is your place. How you position Christ in your heart. And the power you give him. Yes. Yes. This is truth, everyone. This is absolute truth. So please, remember this. Until you take your last breath, remember this. Remember this. Remember what I'm saying to you in the Holy Spirit. Others, pe people, other people, God has lined up just for you to witness to. They're at the door. I don't say any of this lightly. I really don't. We have to push into him. Press into him. Stand against the wiles of the devil his trickery and his deceit. He is death. And to whom much is given, much is expected. And if the Lord has blessed you with insight and the Holy Spirit to see his power in this life, he did it for this purpose. It is not for ourselves. It is for the kingdom. This is why Jesus said, 
if you look to save your life, you will lose it. Because then you're taking control. You're not trusting him. In all adversity, in all things, in all threats. We have to look beyond what we think we see. What is a little agitation to us. Or when we think we're going to fall to our knees and break. He has to be in all that. And it's about his kingdom. It's not about us. This is why, this is why I don't go on and on and on about the saints and the elect and the, the elect elect. Because you know what? If you're focused on that, you're not going to make it. You think you're something special in him? You're not going to make it. Because then you're... You're focusing on yourself, and we are dirty. And he puts the oil in us, and he presses the oil out through adversity, trials, tribulations. This is why you cannot buy the oil. This is why you cannot get all shook up at the devil and his little tricks. He will even send his little minions and your brethren when you don't have your total shield up. And we all have been there. Remember Peter had so much love and compassion for Jesus he was going to stop him from going to the cross. And Christ recognized it immediately and he rebuked it. He didn't rebuke Peter. He rebuked what the devil was doing. Using Peter's love and compassion for Christ to stop the most important thing to ever happen in humanity. Do you see what I'm saying? You know, we are just so narrow-minded and so enclosed in little spaces and our God is so big. He's big. He's bigger than any other thing that lives and breathes, whether it's in the soul, spirit, or the flesh. We don't understand His grace. We truly don't. And this is what's wrong with His children. This is what's wrong with all of us. We don't get it. We don't see the forest for the trees. We don't see the glory that is in the pain, that is in the risk of stepping out. We are not to stay in our secret place. We are to go there and gather strength and truth and wisdom by the Holy Spirit and meditate upon His Word and then carry it forward. This is not a time to hide. This is not a time to shut down your testimony and your witness and your ministry. And this is not the time and many are going into seclusion. And it's not good. It's the opposite of what God would have us do right now. It's the purpose that we're still here. That he spared us and delivered us and did miracles in our lives. Was it so that you could sit in your house and 
be all comfortable in your bed. And just to be blessed for yourself? No, 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 everyone, no. Please listen to me. He's pressing the oil. It might feel like you're in a vice grip. It might feel like it's time to run and hide, but it's not. If we put our flesh in it, we will totally miss what God's doing. If you think about everything that you've read, studied about the Word of God and His Spirit and His truth, you don't run and hide. Self-preservation will cost you everything. Trust what he's doing in your life, in your walk. Trust him. Trust that no matter what it looks like, God is on the throne and he's working. Because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to take you to a little story here in a minute when we finish this. We're going to go to verse 17. This is after Esau and the bir gave up his birthright. Verse 17, For you know also that afterwards, desiring to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance through having sought it with tears. You don't want that to be you. You don't. We don't want that to be us. Because once the door is shut, it's shut. Either you're a worker in the kingdom or you're a self-preserver. See, Esau thought he was going to starve. He couldn't see. God knew his spirit. He said God hated Esau. For Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Well, you know, Jacob wasn't such a nice guy in the beginning. <coughs> nope. But he had a tenacity about him. A perseverance that he just would grab a hold of the Lord and would not let go. So much so that he wrestled with the <laughs> angel of the Lord. And hung on and said, I will not let go until you bless me. Wow. But what did his brother do? He didn't he didn't fight. He didn't complete the race. See when your life might look like it's going down the tubes. It might look like everything God's put in front of you and in your life. will destroy you. And your well-meaning brothers and sisters might say, listen, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this for, for self-preservation. But you know deep in your heart why God did that, why he put it in your life, and you know you've been running a race for 18, 20, 30 years. You've been doing it, you've been doing it, and you're at the home stretch. And you think that if you have to do it one more hour, one more minute, you're not going to make it. Well, don't let the devil lie to you. Because you're going to finish that race. And when you're on your knees and you're exhausted, you're broken, you're tired, you're sick... You just think you can't even get up again. He's going to pick you up. I'm telling you, I've lived this over and over and over. He has delivered me piece by piece by piece. But our true full deliverance is on the way. It's on the way. Keep, keep running your race. 
finish it. He's got the grace already there for you. And the only reason Satan is allowed to be there as a thorn in your flesh or a burden or a very difficult situation that not many could endure, his grace is sufficient for you because he's let that thing be there to humble you. Otherwise, you would have thought you were some flying guru of Christ and you'd have got too high-minded and you'd have got too selfish with his revealings and his revelations to you and you would have thought everything's so personal. And instead, what might mean something big to you that same thing he communicated to you in an hour that you needed strength and guidance and clarity. It means so much more to someone else, but you think it's so personal and it's not. This is how he works. He's pouring his spirit over his entire body right now. And this is why many are called and few are chosen. Because they go into self-preservation mode. And he can't do anything with that. He can't do anything with that. And if you throw that down, you're going to be consumed by darkness. I'm telling you, the darkness will eventually consume you. You won't know what end is up. You will be so confused and then you will be confounded at his return. Oh, or when you go home. And you don't want that. None of us want that. We want to hear, you ran the race, you finished it. There was a man that I heard another preacher speak on one time. And this man was married to a very difficult woman. And she was cruel. And she had a vicious tongue. And she wasn't very nice. She was in pain. She was suffering. And she put many abuses upon her husband. And he kept staying faithful and doing what he was called to do. And even this minister said to him, I don't know why you put up with that. I don't know why you keep staying there. And taking care of this and being with her. Well, the man said, I must run my race. Well, time passed and this man's wife passed away. And they were all at the funeral. And the man was very heartbroken. And many didn't understand because they knew, they knew the truth. And that preacher was standing there and he looked at him and he saw the truth. And he said to himself, he finished his race. He stayed to the end. He ran his race. And the grace of God is just beaming off of him. This minister could see it. So what I'm saying is, we don't understand God's ways. Everything's not supposed to be all beautiful roses and no thorns. He didn't promise you a rose garden. He didn't promise you no adversity. He didn't promise you no trials, no abuses. They abused our Savior. 
in the worst way. And not only did he hang on that cross, he went down to Sheol and freed the prisoners that were before him that never even knew there was a Savior. We don't understand God's timing. We don't understand his measure. The cross is so precious. And we just gloss over it. Oh yes, Jesus hung on the cross. Da -da, happened, this happened, that happened. We don't see that he bore everything. He took in all darkness, all sin, all sin. Do you understand that? That's really wicked. Real wickedness, real darkness. He took it all. Every disease. I've, I've seen some really bad diseases. I've seen some really bad suffering on one individual I can't imagine what it was like to take it in for all humanity. Don't minimize that cross. You better keep your eyes on it and you better understand it fully. Because it will shut your mouth. You either trust God's got his protective hand on you and what seems is going to kill you will be nothing in the end. It won't have an effect. What should have damaged you mentally beyond repaired where you all you could do is stare off and drool? Well, his grace is going to restore you and make sure you have everything you need to witness to your brothers and sisters and to the lost what it's all about it's what it's all about it's not about our little walk with him by ourselves and keep this for that's like being greedy how can you be greedy with the cross and the grace of God we can't we cannot be greedy with that so why do we obsess about titles and place I mean the, the, the disciples did this they were arguing amongst themselves who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. But it's a collaborative force. It takes all of his body to just do a minuscule part of what he did. So once you start thinking you're special, well, you'll get plucked out. Oh, this is where the weeping and the gnashing and the wailing, the grinding of teeth. Oh, that's pain, everyone. That's horrific spiritual pain. It will make your bodily pain that you the worst pain be nothing. Yes, I'm going to repeat 17. For you know also that afterwards, desiring to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance through having sought it with tears. That was in Genesis 27, 36-39, by the way. Verse 18. For you have not drawn near to the mountain, having been touched, and having been lit with fire, and to gloom and darkness and of tempest, and to a sound of a trumpet. And to a voice of words, which those having begged that not a word be added to them, for they could not bear the thing enjoined. Even if a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned or shot through with a dart. That's Exodus 19, everyone. They couldn't stand to hear the voice of God come out of that mountain. They covered their ears. They begged for it to stop. Oh. Uh. Does the voice of God make you want to crawl under a rock or does it draw you out and empower you to empower others? Like Jude says, not 
look in at the garment defiled, but the soul. And for some, having compassion, and others pulling them right out of the fire. Although the fire can be warming and comforting, or it can be scorching, burning, consuming. Because our Lord is a consuming fire, everybody. Verse 21, and so fearful was the thing appearing. Moses said, I am terrified and trembling, but you have drawn near Mount Zion, even the city of the living God to heavenly Jerusalem and to myriads of angels. Look, they were at Mount Sinai, which is the mountain of death. That is where the ministration of death of the law was given on the stone tablets. Something no man could ever fulfill. But we are on Mount Zion. You can't have one foot on Mount Sinai and one foot on Mount Zion. Either you're walking in his grace and his laws and his truth is written in your heart. And you're connecting your soul and your spirit with him so that he can guide you. And then when you fall, he uses it to his glory. And he extends his grace to you. And there's nothing, nothing precious than the cross and his grace. To Jeru heavenly Jerusalem, that's our, going to be our home and it's coming to a myriad of angels, our loved ones who passed away. You know what? Do not discount because you don't know you don't know who he's collected, who he's extended his grace to and touched them in their dying moments while they were transitioning out of this flesh life. His grace is so powerful. This is why we don't get to judge. And I can tell you, he showed me something so powerful in his grace. It's going to blow you away. I'm going to reveal it to you when we get done with Hebrews 12. But you have drawn near Mount Zion, even the city of the living God, to a heavenly Jerusalem and to myriads of angels and to an assembly, a church of the firstborn ones having been enrolled in heaven and to God, the judge of all, and to spirits of just ones who have been perfected and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to blood of sprinkling, speaking better things than that of Abel. Watch that you do not refuse the one speaking. For if these do not escape who refused him, who divinely warned them on earth, much rather we those turning away from heaven, whose voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. That's Haggai 2.6, by the way. Verse 27, now the words yet once make clear the removal of the things being shaken as having been made so that the things not shaken may remain. We have to be on that rock. And when that great shaking comes, we're going to be firmly bolted to him. That's not self-preservation, everyone. Walking it out. Walking out your faith. You have to walk it out. Walk it out. Why? Because other souls are being put in your path. Just for the purpose of God's grace over you. For this reason, receiving an unshakable kingdom, let us have grace by which we may serve God well-pleasingly with reverence and awe, for indeed our God is a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 4.24 Listen, you look at that mountain and you shout, Grace, grace, grace unto your mountain. Shout it. Physically do this. Look at that mountain that seems to be in your way, whether it be yourself, 
a situation or whatever, because deep down it's all about what's in our hearts. And then we are able to extend our hearts for others and extend the grace of God. So look at that mountain and say, grace, grace, grace unto this mountain, and it will move. This is how we move the mountain with the faith of a mustard seed. Listen, go to Matthew 8. I want to tell you, you all remember what I told you about my mom passing and my walk with my mom and my mom was a Christian. She raised me in the church. She was a deacon. She was the choir director. She was the Sunday school teacher. And it was a good-sized church. It wasn't no little, you know, one-room church. This was a night. This was a very big church, and she she lived for the church. But she had a falling away. I don't understand it. But it happened. She went to a religion of false gods. And my mom would kneel to this box and she would chant and My mother became very ill with a very rare, rare brain disease. We had a better chance at winning the lottery as a family than this disease striking my mother. And it was a death sentence. That's for sure. And here's the thing. I thought, oh... What's going to happen to her soul? Uh, what's going on here, Lord? And uh, that disease struck her to where she eventually like turned to stone. Yeah, like Lot's wife. But here's the thing we miss if we're not looking. In that disease, my mother could no longer chant. She lost her ability to talk the last two years of her life and she definitely could not bend down on her knees and do all that. And where my mother should have had extreme discomfort, depression, despair, God's grace, ran, it just ran off of her, everyone. My mother always had a smile. Even when she couldn't talk and she couldn't smile with her mouth anymore, she could smile with her eyes and everyone was amazed. Her doctors were like, Kathy, are you depressed? Are you in pain, Kathy? Are you handling your pain? And she would smile. And she'd shake her head. No, I'm fine. So then came the time when she was passing. And I've told you my testimony of that whole entire time what God was showing me. And she spent the last two days before she died, that whole weekend she spent in transition. I was alone with her. Late that night by her bed, and the movie Happy Feet came on. And they were singing. And it just reminded me of my mother's beautiful voice when she could sing in the choir. And I had this distinct memory of my mom 
standing in church and I'm just a little thing and I'd look up to her and watch her mouth move singing those hymns and reciting the Lord's Prayer in Psalm 23. And so I prayed over her and I recited the Lord's Prayer. I recited Psalm 23. And she was whimpering through the whole thing. And she was drifting in and out, but her eyes would be open, but I could see she was not there. I knew she was in transition. I knew she was passing. I knew God wasn't going to get her up out of the bed and walk her out of that hospital in the physical sense. She was in Our Lady of Mercy Hospital. There was a crucifix above her bed. The hospital was just so full of him and his healing. It was in gold, big gold letters in the atrium of the hospital. When you walked in and it said healing in the name of Jesus Christ in gold letters. And I was concerned for her soul and I was praying and You know, our Christian upbringing and our rigid thinking about God, we think, oh, this soul is just not going to make it. It's doomed. But God showed me so much right there that that's not true. And then she spoke. And she said to me, Hi, honey, I love you. My fever broke. And my mother was all contorted and drawn up. My aunt said that was one of the first things she noticed was because her muscles were relaxing. and She was going back to the way she was. And her arms would get really hurt because they would just be so tight and tense and drawn up. And I had bought her these real soft stuffed animals and I'd stick them in the creases of her arms. She was sweating so bad from her fever and my aunt wanted to take the animals out of her arms because she thought they were so fluffy they were making her hotter and my mother wouldn't have it. She would not let my aunt take those stuffed animals. And I just got revealed to me last night the significance of what my mom said. I was just so, I mean, she's been gone since 2008. And I didn't hear that second part because I knew, well, well she's dying. I, I, dis I disregarded her saying my fever broke. And God revealed it to me. And the whole time she was passing, that whole week I was there, God kept bringing up the numbers 444. Every time I looked at the clock, it was 444. I'd get something at the store. It'd be $4.44. I'd lost my credit card and they gave me a new one and it was the last three digits on it were 444. I mean, it was just unreal. And I didn't understand any of that. But he revealed something to me last night. And I was reading. And it was in Matthew 8.
verse 14. And coming to the house of Peter, Jesus saw his mother-in-law laid out and burning with fever. And he touched her hand and the fever left her. And she rose up and served them. You know, I'm reading out of the greens. I always do. But we're going to look at this in King James. I just want to remind you again, the words of my mom were so powerful because my mother couldn't speak for two years. Two years I didn't hear my mother's voice. Two years she couldn't communicate. She couldn't say if she was hungry, tired, thirsty, nothing. No words. Just whimpers. So, we're going to pick this little bitty part of Matthew 8 out. And you're going to look at this in the Greek, and it's just amazing. And I just didn't see it. You know, Christ is just so amazing. And His power is just... There's no limits, everybody. And... We don't know. We don't know what God's doing. We get free will, but we don't know how God extends His grace. We are so boxed in with our thinking and our logic. And He's so massive and so big and so powerful that... He will use someone to minister, even in death and dying. Yes, he will. He really will, everyone. So let's look at this. So Jesus goes to Peter's house. And his wife's mother... She was laying there. And the word laid. His wife's mother laid. It means less violent or intense, but to throw, arise, cast out, dung, <clears throat> lay, lie, pour, put up, sin, strike, throw down, thrust. Yeah. So powerful. And it is with the force. A force. Like you'd slap someone to buffet them. Yeah, like Paul. With the messenger of Satan. To buffet him. Thorn in the flesh. Yeah. Just think about that. That's that's just so amazing, everybody. It means to be violently displaced from a position that you've gained. An attack of disease. To lie sick in the bed. To be prostrated by sickness. Yeah, think about that. Casting down oneself. Yeah, to throw or let go of a thing without caring where it falls. Well, we know that our Savior doesn't do anything without a purpose. And he will use maladies and disease and everything to buffet us. It's his grace. It makes his grace so sufficient. So his wife's mother was laid and sick of a fever. Now this word in the Greek is G4 
four, four, five. Yes, four, four, four. You know, just like that time I kept seeing and that number that kept coming up and over and over. And then five, Grace. Yeah, he made this specifically a message for me. And I. it took me nine years, everybody, to get the picture. <laughs> Call us a slow learner, okay? <sighs> to be on fire. To be sick with a fever is to be on fire. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm hmm To be on fire. And it means just that. To be sick with a fever of fire. Yeah. It's purifying, cleansing fire that burns off all the rudiments and the waste and the dross. Yes. That fire. <laughs> In verse 15, and he touched her hand. And the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. Well, I'm going to tell you, this word minister, it means to be a servant. It means to be a deacon, to serve in the church as a deacon, to attend to anything that may serve another's interest, to minister a thing to one, to serve one by supplying anything, to be an attendant, to wait upon, a host, friend, or a teacher, technically to act as a Christian deacon administrator and to serve, use the office of a deacon. Wow. So as she was, and though it changed, and though her free will took her down a road that was surely death and despair, God poured his grace out. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And I knew, I knew it was a miracle for my mother to speak after two years of nothing. And for her, I, I, look, I thought I'd made her mad. I wasn't sure. I thought she was going to go home. And I would never know until I got to heaven or with Christ would I know if she was mad for me reading scripture over her because my mom just couldn't stand the word of God anymore. My, my uncle died, her brother, and we were at her his funeral. And... Chris, of course it was a Christian service and they were reading scripture and my mother was just bouncing around in her seat and twisting around and it was like my dad looked over at her and he, yeah, he says, Catherine did someone light a fire under your ass or what? He didn't understand it. My dad didn't want nothing to do with that religion. My dad wasn't a religious man. He hadn't been to church since he was a kid, but he was baptized and he knew Jesus and he didn't understand. And I was, she was sitting between us and my dad said that to her and I was like, whoa. So I'm just saying everybody, we are so narrow-minded. We think that we are representatives of God and then we become hardened and then Christ becomes a stumbling block even to us. We don't see what he's doing. We don't see the end. We don't get to see the in between, the, the beginning, the in-between, and the end all at once. No, we have to walk it out. Walk it out and he will show it to us. Well, I hope that this really touched you today because it was just profound to me. And uh, every day brings something new. I'm learning every day. Every day he's showing me something so amazing. And I don't want to keep you here too long because I know that this is a big piece to chew. We just don't understand his ways, everyone. And when we start to think we do, 
and we close our eyes to the big picture, well, that's when we get in trouble. When we think we know, when we don't. When we declare that we know, and we don't. And when we go walking into captivity, save our own flesh, and we are not willing to go through a little discomfort or a lot of discomfort or abuses or that's just not right. That's what we say. That's just not right. This can't go on anymore. And here he's doing a magnificent work or he wouldn't have ordained it. He wouldn't have allowed it to pass. He wouldn't have allowed it. Well, I love you all. I'll be back really soon. I'm going to be back tonight because we are going to um, touch on a couple more things. And we're definitely digging back into Matthew 24. we got to do it because our Savior is returning. And our Savior is all we need to just walk this out. And finish our race. As difficult as it might be. Because some really, really have a difficult race. And I think most of the ones that he's going to use in these days. They're going through a lot. And he's going to use it, everyone. Look beyond what we see. Look at the big picture. Look at the power of our Lord and the awesomeness and the amazing size that he is and shout grace, grace, grace to this mountain and it will move out of your way and the glory of God is right there. You can't see it because the mountain is blocking it and it's right there. It's been there all along and it's still there. God bless y'all. I love you much.